Michael Gomez, and I'm a real estate broker and an investor here in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm Seth Mosley, Grammy award-winning songwriter and real estate investor. We host a monthly meetup in Middle Tennessee for anyone who wants to build passive income, not only for retirement, but for today. On the first Wednesday of every month, we bring in an expert from every area of investing to help you with things like finding deals, getting your financing locked in, asset protection, every kind of investing, so much more. Our videos are all about delivering that content to you. Go to musicandmoneyig.com for more info on our free monthly events. Hit subscribe on the page so you don't miss any awesome content and hit that like button if you like it. Don't let all the fur on my jacket distract you. Here's the content. Without further ado, we've got our speaker for today who is going to be speaking on using existing equity to grow your passive income. He's a creative lender. He's an investor. He's a syndicator. Give it up for my friend and official sponsor of Music Money Investors Group, Billy Brown. Woohoo! Okay, here we go. Making my speaking debut here at Music and Money. Um, this is nice because I can't see anybody, but... It's a great place to be making my debut. Um, I normally hide behind uh, my mentor, uh, Yogi Doer. Um, uh, he's, to, he's a great speaker. But uh, I've been encouraged by many people in this room to come out and uh, share my knowledge uh, to be more impactful. Um, Tom Monty has been fantastic, obviously Seth and, and Michael as well. So you talk about getting out of your comfort zone. I'm very much out of my comfort zone. So I have uh, <coughs> prepared something here for you guys. Just to kind of share for those of you in the room, but also those who are online, especially as new people, who has been on this stage before me? Because I want you to know like how cool this group is versus other groups that you, you see out there. So um, here's your past speakers, local legends, Tom Lonnie, Yogi Doer, Chris Picurio. I mean, massive amounts of, of knowledge there. Your industry experts, I mean, you know, obviously Seth and Michael have done fantastic in not only music, but also real estate investing. Uh, Glenn Mathers, Mark Kenny, and then Bill Allen, um, Six Figure Flipping. I mean, these guys are legit people and legitly cool people, as you can see right there. And then you get into the mega influencers in the industry of real estate investing. Uh, Kate Flanders, uh, obviously in the uh, number one bestseller there. You got the number two podcast on real estate investing, Russ Gray and Robert Helms on the Real Estate Guys Radio. Think about that. The number two podcast. Oh, and then we got number one, Brandon Turner, and then uh, three times he's been here, and then his, uh, his, his partner's coming on. How cool is that? I mean, these guys deserve a, a lot of applause and a lot of support for being able to put these things on because it's not cheap, especially with the video equipment they've got going on here. But to do it for free, and that's you know, one of the reasons why I stepped up going, you guys, you know, you don't not try to bring these gurus in here to go sell boot camps. They're legitimately trying to educate, uh, educate folks. So, um, but yeah, so I, I, I got to admit that I'm uh, quite nervous. Um, we are in friendly confines, and just you know, make sure, you know, and this means yes, is uh, <laughs> there's grace in the room, right, guys? There's, the, okay, good, good. So, um, you know, so I was thinking about this, and, and, and like, man, I'm, how do I get past this nervous? Because I'm, you know, I'm a former golfer. It's like, I understand, like, you know, the pressure, stuff like that. But I remember this, this quote came to my head. It's like, I know I saw it someplace. So it's really, it's not what you say that makes you memorable. It's how you make the audience feel. Anyone who said that? Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's about content. I mean, I want to, you know, this is about content, be able to educate you guys and, and, and show you a different way of thinking. Um, so it, it is, that's my joke, by the way. So hopefully uh, somebody laughed at that one, especially online. Um, so why are we here? Um, we're going to learn about the origins of money from depository, not depository lenders. We're going to, um, you know, how do you access the equity in, in rentals without selling? Uh, how do you acquire more? Uh, and larger properties. How to reset your limit on Fannie and Freddie. How many guys are Fannie and Freddie out on your rental properties? Anyone? Good. It means you got more room to go. That's actually not the best place to go for your rental properties, by the way, uh, to, to fund those. How to increase your aggregate limit at your bank. How many guys know what aggregate limit is? We'll talk about that here in a second. The pros and cons of non-recourse lending. 
And then we're going to update uh, everyone on my big hairy goal. I'm sorry I wasn't at the last one with Kate. I was at the CCIM um, training. But I know you guys have been um, wanting to hold me accountable for what I said in February. And uh, we'll have that at the end after that's kind of more personal, but uh, you know, what you guys are here for. So, all right. I like to put this up front so everyone kind of captures information. Many of you guys are on my newsletter, but uh, those on the, in the internet world, um, here's how you get hold of me. I've got a Facebook lending um, uh, page here. There's my email address. Uh, there is an ebook on this if you don't want to watch this entire webinar and just actually get to the point. Um, just download the book.billybrown.me and it should walk you through how to, how to get that ebook. And then I do have a weekly newsletter. Um, I do cover quite a bit of topics as far as real estate investing. Um, if there's a topic on there that, um, that I haven't covered, which is actually hosted on my, um, my Billy Brown Lending uh, Facebook page, uh, just let me know and I can go back and cover some stuff. Uh, I am a CCIM candidate. Uh, if you guys don't know what CCIM is, it is basically the master's degree of commercial real estate investing. Uh, very cool designation, very in-depth. Um, it's a lot more than I ever thought about. And then my day job is uh, VP of Business Development and Alternative Capital Solutions. I'll tell you guys about, about that later because we don't want to advertise really what we're doing. That's not about what we're, why we're here. I want to educate first. If you guys have questions on lending, we'd love to be able to, to help you out. All right, so here's my background. What gives me the authority to stand up here and talk to you guys besides of being a, 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 a sponsor of this thing? I am not a musician, but I do appreciate you guys. I have no tattoos. I do not look good in tight jeans. I am a former model. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Uh, you'll, I have pictures. I have pictures, guys. Don't laugh. It hurt my feelings. I am from Stillwater, Oklahoma. So, of course, I know Garth Brooks, close friend. Not met Garth Brooks. I'm putting you out there. I want to meet Garth. Um, I'm one degree separation from him, like 15 different ways. I did live at the Olympic Training Center, that is the truth. I am a failed professional golfer and I house hacked my way to where I am today. There's my modeling picture. That's a setup. Yeah, yeah, baby. That is a leisure shoot. Here's some photos of me in uh, golf attire. Uh, I am a three time Oklahoma Golf Association state amateur champion. Long time ago, a long time ago. Uh, there's more action uh, shots as well. How many of you guys love those knee-high socks, man? Those are nice. Those pants are fire. I still have those. Yeah. Those are legit. <laughs> I thought about it. I thought about it. Uh, so here is uh, Garth Brooks' close friend, John Martin. Um, really cool guy. I don't know Garth, but that's one of his good friends. Now here's my music photos. So me with Amy Grant, and of course you got to have Michael W. Smith, which I think uh, somebody in this room may know him fairly well. Uh, maybe Tom Lonnie, you know, no Michael, may have produced a few of his music, the CDs. And then of course the uh, the queen of music here in Nashville, which is Amy Curlin. How many of you guys know Amy? You know, Bluebird Cafe, the founder of that. We've actually gotten to know Amy uh, quite well. She's a fantastic human being, and uh, love her to death. And then here's me with some uh, folks you might know in the real estate investing world. Obviously, Rich Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, G. Edward Griffin. How many of you guys have read that, his book, The Creature from Jekyll Island? How many of you guys are scared to death of, it, of the world now after you read that thing? I mean, it's just crazy. You guys need to read that. Uh, Chris Martinson, again, you know, Tin Hat stuff going on there, but it's, it's legit. And then Brandon Turner, of course, from, uh, he's been here three times. That's Seth's BFF. Here's what started it all. Uh, my first event that Michael Gomez invited me to, this guy spoke, uh, Robert Helms. And I was so blown away, going, oh my gosh, what's a podcast? And these guys are number two in the, in the nation on podcasts? That's pretty cool. And it's actually, the content was amazing. And he's not selling a boot camp or a class afterwards. So uh, long story short, I actually uh, went to a couple of their events on syndication great folks, and this actually just, just hooked me on, uh, on Step It Up being a sponsor for these guys going, you guys need a lending sponsor, especially in the commercial world, to, to be able to help your people get the right type of lending for the right project. 
All right, so here's where I'm at as far as my background in investing. Let me put this up real quick. Here's how I started. House on the left is actually going to be for sale here. This is the first house I bit about uh, back in 2006 for $78,000. My landlord kicked me out of the house to go buy this. Uh, I was hoping she'd be here today because she's a very sweet person. Um, but it's over in Wedgwood, Houston. If you guys know where that is, by the fairgrounds, new Major League Soccer Stadium. But now it rents for uh, $13.95. And then we, my wife and I were sitting there and decided, you know what? We, this place is blowing up. People are getting like $900 of rent. This is four years ago for houses like this. Let's go buy a duplex, live in that, rent out the other side and rent out this. We, we have no house payment. And you know what happened? It worked. It worked beautifully. We had no mortgage payment. It was awesome. You fast forward four years, I sold that thing for, I bought it for 158 and we sold it for uh, last year for 300000 I put a little bit of work into it, not much, but just because of the demand in the area for Donaldson. And then later, I did my first little mini syndication partnership on this triplex over um, in 37205, which is by the um, uh, Nashville State. And that's a corporate rental on top with two single family, uh, two one units underneath. And we were getting about 5,100 a month on that. Now we're paying for utilities and expenses there, but it's a pretty cool little deal. Now, the thing I'm proud about the most is we actually negotiated owner financing on this thing um, at 4% interest rate. And we didn't have a payment for 90 days. So that's pretty cool. Can you guys get 4% interest, interest right now? No, no, it's pretty cool. So that's where I started. Now we're at the point of like, oh my gosh, we have a baby and I don't have time to manage these things, so let's get rid of them and go buy bigger things. And that's why we're here, right? So, first of all, how many guys are into numbers? Anyone don't like math or doesn't like math? Okay, I'm sorry. You just hold tight. We'll draw some pictures or something like that later on, but just hold tight. This is, this is going to get into some numbers. But first of all, I want to set the foundation as far as where lenders get their money. And there's, in this world that we're talking about for real estate investors, ignore Fannie and Freddie, there's really two worlds. You get depository lenders and non-depository lenders. So first one's easy. Depository lenders, they basically borrow money from you. And then they lend it back to you. Now, they want to have more money there, so money market CDs, um, chicken counts. They combine that money with money they borrow from the Federal Reserve. So their cost of funds runs in about 1% to 2%. And the commercial loans are serviced in-house. So they have a finite amount of money until they can get more deposits. You guys tracking? Finite. How do you get more money in a bank to go lend out? Deposits. So here's where I'm going with this thing. The federal government, along with the board directors of that bank, dictates how much money can be lent in certain asset classes. It's not just a free-for-all going, hey, if it's a good deal, we'll go, you know, we'll go lend on it. They have to break up the amount of money they think they're going to have during that year or that quarter into what they call buckets, whether that be commercial-backed real estate, um, unsecured loans, car loans, whatever they want to lend on, they break those up into buckets and little minor buckets. So even if you have a great deal and their bucket is full, are you going to get your loan funded? Nope. They might tell you yes, hoping that something will get paid off and then that lender can get you, um, get you back in there, but typically not. So that's a little bit of fr frustration there. They're great to work with, but they're a little bit more restrictive on, on what they can do. Now let's go to non-banks. Where do they get their funds from? They go borrow from other people, some investors, from REITs, from institutional people, hedge funds is uh, kind of the broad uh, brush word there. So they're going to give them a preferred return, you know, 6 to 8%, somewhere around there. And they're going to fund the loan request, and they're going to package off the loan, and they're going to sell it to other institutional investors. That's kind of the flow of the loans. Their money is more unlimited. They have to go do these loans to make money. Are they incentivized? Yes, they are much incentivized. They have declared to their investor group, we're going to hit these certain numbers to get you these certain returns with the amount of money you gave to us. So we need to lend this out. Now, they're still regulated, but it's a lot less headaches. But it's also a narrow box because these things are going to be bought and securitized. 
Anyone know what securitized means? Just package up on Wall Street, baby. That's all it is. It's traded. Yeah, exactly. Um, so typically, they're going to recapitalize anywhere from you know 30 to 90 days, somewhere in there. So they're always going to get a constant flow of money. Trade-off here is you're going to have a little bit higher interest rates, but more uh, favorable lending uh, options for you. Stuff that we work with a, a lot. Everyone tracking there? Okay. This is an idea, and I'm going to probably need Tom's assistance on this thing, calculating the IRR. We got this in the mail. You guys saw this a lot. This is actually from SunTrust, now BB&T or BBT SunTrust, whatever the name is going to be. Here's a great deal, and I want you guys to get your wallets and uh, go ahead and wire them the funds. This is a fantastic deal. If you give them $100,000, they will give you $750 gift card one time. You, but usually after 90 days of, of, of using the money in the account, and then also you got to do some withdrawals and all that. How many of you guys think that's a good deal? <laughs> Seriously, if you guys think it's a good deal, come see me, because I'll give you $800 <laughs> right now for 100000 On their same website, if you want to go, I just use the car loan, for example. We're just, you know, getting, get you conceptually what's going on. They will loan you $100,000 on a five-year term. That's $1,887 per month or $22,000 annually for five years. How much does that money cost them? $750. Think that's a pretty good return? Yeah, that's why banks have a lot of money. Now, it's really easy to get their, get, for them to take your money, but to get it back is a little bit more difficult, as you're about to see. Everyone tracking so far? We're, this is the foundational stuff here, so you guys can kind of see where we're going with this and what the, the power of uh, what we got going on. Here is how, uh, here's who uh, approves my loan at the banks. Here's how it kind of flows up there. You're usually going to talk to somebody with a VP title of commercial lending. They're going to send the deal in, and then they're going to consult with their senior VP, and it's a you know, whole bunch of people that they uh, oversee. And then they're going to float your deal up to the underwriter. Underwriters, you know, there's probably a few underwriters there that's, you know, they're working with, and it's either yay or nay, up or down. And then they'll underwrite it. If they go, yes, they'll send it to the HUD, HUD underwriter, who's the head of everything, who takes the brunt of everything. And underwriters are fantastic guys. Don't, I'm not trying to downplay them. They're fantastic people. And then once the underwriter um, gives them the thumbs up, then it goes to a loan committee, usually three to five people. And then if there's any questions on that or it's outside their scope or outside their, their asset class, then they're going to go to the board of directors for a, basically a, a veto uh, vote there. A lot of hands in the cookie jar. Oh, and by the way, any, any guys in here in residential lending? I know there's one person here. If you guys ever, I mean, uh, Diane's probably may not uh, uh, calculate this or not. How many people actually touch your loan from start to finish? Have you ever calculated that? From originator to closing packet to attorneys, it's over 80. Over 80. Probably more than that now. Commercial lending, maybe 60. <laughs> so, a lot of people. Here's reality. All those people up there, and then bank uh, regulators, compliance officers, and lawyers. That's who actually is really dictating everything here, because the number one fear of the banks is called an audit. Even if you do a loan fantastic or run your bank uh, perfectly or your lending institution perfectly, you're always in fear of an audit. The big boy government institutions can come down. Here's a, a sampling of who regulates lending, both depository and non-depository. And by the way, I think the, these guys actually coordinate and going, hey, yeah, um, FDIC, this is the Federal Reserve Board. We're going to go talk to uh, ABC Bank over here about this. Um, you guys talked to them yet about it? Oh, yeah, we got it. Okay, well, we won't talk to them then. No. This can be an invasion if uh, you do something wrong or they sniff something wrong. And they can come at any time. So there's a lot of, what I'm saying is there's a lot of fear in the lending world when it comes to bank lending. And banks are fantastic. I mean, community banks are fantastic for, for, your, local, so for your deals. But I'm just telling you right now, with the way that the, the, the government is, as far as the intrusion on the banking industry, especially post-2007, 2008, it's scary. These guys are lending out of fear. 
So you guys got to be aware of that when you go in and talk to people. It's not like, hey, it's a fantastic deal. Why don't you lend on this thing? Well, there's a couple other reasons. You know, one is, I mean, there's, is there enough room in their asset bucket? Two is, is it even close to the line of what the federal government allows us to do? And if so, if it's close, we're not going to do it. It's got to be way inside the box. You guys tracking so far? Okay. Kevin? <laughs> this is Kevin's line. He, uh, this is his tagline. I, I stole it from him, but I gave him credit because he says it's so funny. So you don't want your equity sitting on the couch eating Doritos. Like a, like a lazy teenager playing video games? Exactly. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about today. How many guys have rental properties right now? All right. So your equity is there, sitting there. Just sitting there. We've all seen this. Like Nashville, you know, the, the, the United States has grown exponentially. Not even rents have gone up because there's more people out there that need homes. But the values have gone up as well. So you're sitting on a bunch of equity, and what's it doing there? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So we're going to talk about how to access that without selling. Right, here's the math part, guys. Sorry for the non-math people. But conceptually here, if there's any math errors, by the way, just let me know afterwards. This is not trying to be perfect if I'm a dollar off or something, or even like way off. Conceptually, follow me, folks. All right, let's just say you bought two or four um, identical rental properties in 2014. You paid about $200,000 a piece for them, so it's about $800,000. You put your normal 20% down using a you know, Fannie Freddie loan, something like that. You know, uh, your loan amount's about $640,000 at that time. 2019 rolls around. Values have gone up, now it's about $1.2 million. Does that seem about right? Especially around Nashville. You bond these things the right way, it's, they've gone way up. You or your tenants actually have paid the loan down to about 575. That's 625,000 dollars in trapped equity. It's sitting there, doing nothing. Now you can sell it. There's plenty of realtors in the room would love for you to sell that thing. But how many of you guys are trying to sell a property with a tenant in it? It ain't fun. It ain't fun at all. Because you can coordinate with them, see you know, if they're dogs, if they're smokers, if they're whatever. It's, you're not going to get the highest, uh, highest value. And then you got to sell it. If you sell one of these things, you know, you get a 1031 or do something else with it. That's a big pain in the you know what. So what do you do? Why am I saying this? What, what's your rate of return on that, that equity? Zero? Negative. Opportunity cost. Negative, especially in today's world. All right, let's look at the math. And again, these are just for approximations here. If you guys have specific deals that you want to look at, we can get a term sheet pretty quick on these things. But just kind of give you conceptually as far as what can be done with this. So most lenders out there will lend up to 75% of the appraised value. We do have a couple that will do 80%. Um, you subtract out your loan balance, your appraisals, your closing costs, and then down your lender fees. I just lumped all these things together because I was running out of room. Your lender fees, attorneys, prepaid escrow, broker fees, yada, yada, yada. That's, you know, down about $40,000. The prepaid escrow thing, when you go to these things that are securitized, they want to make sure the taxes and insurance are paid, obviously. So they're going to require you to escrow them. So they're going to have that lumped in the, in the loan as well. So easy math, cost you 50 grand to do this. $275,000. That's a lot of money. I mean, not for Bill Allen, but, you know, $275,000. It's a lot of money. What can you do with that money? Well, first of all, well, Chris isn't here because it's obviously tax season, but typically that's tax-free. These things are 30-year uh, amortized loans. Instead of having four loan payments, or if you guys have multiple properties out there that are, you know, a dozen or so, that you got to keep track of all these payments, you're tied to one payment. Obviously, the taxes and insurance are included in that thing, so you have to worry about end of the year um, uh, paying those tax bills. The properties, here's the key thing. People are like, well, I want to strip all my equity out there. You don't worry about that, because the properties still have to positive cash flow at a 1.25. And DSCR means debt service um, coverage ratio. In English, that means you have to have 25% more income than, um, than your mortgage payment. 
after expenses. So you're going to have a positive cash flow. Here's the beauty of this thing. It does not report on your personal credit, and it's non-recourse. How many of you guys know what non-recourse is? Pipe up, what is it? Correct. Here's the definition from Investopedia. Basically, the, the property is collateral. It's got to stand on its own. Again, these things are securitized. So they got to look pretty much the same, and they've got a cash flow. The reason being, if something screws up, they're going to come get the property and take the property, and they're not going to come after you for anything like less than what the property's worth. Say another 2007, 2008 happens, which is not going to happen anytime soon, they're not coming after you personally to go take you down. These things are, are on their own. It's pretty cool. What does that do for you? You're Fannie and Freddie. Opens you back up. Because now you got no more Fannie and Freddie loans on your, if you guys are um, you know, lender people, on your application there, your, your uh, 1003, you're just listing the income and no li liabilities. Same thing in your balance sheet. You get the equity from these properties on your balance sheet, but none of the debt. What does that do for your net worth? It goes up. So here it is. An asset shows up on your balance sheet, but not the liability. When that happens, guess what the lenders want to do at the banks? They can increase your aggregate limit. And then obviously reset your uh, ability to use your Fannie and Freddie loans if you do intend to go that way. Again, not recommended unless it's, you know, unless you've got a really good relationship there. Pretty cool stuff. I mean, think, think about that. Now, they just gave you a check for $275,000. You may be more, maybe less than, than um, what you got. What can you do with this? Let me give you three examples here, and then you guys pipe in with other ideas. Easy one is you go pay cash for a deal, and then you can refinance that with a uh, Fannie Freddie loan. You usually do that, you know, within six months. Use a new appraised value and just recycle it about every six months. You want to jump into larger investments, which is why we're here. You can buy probably about a million dollar asset or multiple properties, and if you just use cash on cash numbers when you leverage that, that money, that could produce you anywhere from let's say twenty-seven to forty thousand dollars in additional net income if you're getting uh, 10 to 15% cash on cash. Double your assets, almost double your cash flow. What did it cost you? Nothing. You repurpose that equity. Another strategy we have is we have a, um, an unsecured, non-recourse line of credit. The, the company we work with will do up to five million, but uh, they'll end up like 80% of the, the acquisition. So. Let's just say you have this, you can probably get about a million dollars line of credit to go do multiple deals. Just three ideas. What are, what are, what are things that you do with $275,000 in your senior bank account? Maybe participate in someone else's deal? Maybe, I mean, want to go fund your, overfund your life insurance policy? Do whatever you want, whatever you want to with it. Pay off your home? Go help Bill's uh, um, nonprofit out. Where do you want to? So it just opens up more possibilities there for you when it comes to leverage, especially now when we think there's going to be a little bit of dip in the marketplace here in the next, I don't know, probably 12 to 24 months, that we're going to have some softening and hopefully some more deals out there that are more palatable before the next, uh, next ramp up. So you position yourself for that... Um, for that, down, uh, that uh, coming downturn is, is, uh, is a good idea. All right, so here's a, the overview. Pretty simple. Um, usually, and most people are like, hey, well, uh, I'm not employed anymore. I may have a little credit hit for whatever reason because of, you know, I leverage credit cards, you know, my flips or whatever. They don't really care about this thing. Usually 640 credit score and above is pretty good. Uh, here's some hairiness in there, but not to get too, too in-depth in details. Ownership structure needs to be uh, the same across the entity that owns the properties. So if you guys are investing with other people in other areas, and it's a 40, 30, 20 split, or whatever the math works out to be in different types of things, it needs to be the same across the board when you go, um, when you go do these things. 
They're going to require a special purpose entity. They actually like Delaware. You guys know what SPE is? Basically allows the, um, if there's a foreclosure or a deed in lieu, they can take your property pretty quickly. That's all it is. And Delaware is obviously more, you know, investor friendly and business friendly. Usually your minimum home value is going to be around $75,000. Again, here's the, uh, the kind of the bad part there. They're going to escrow for taxes and insurance, and they got to pre-fund that at closing. Again, these things are securitized, so you want to, they got all look the same. For this to make sense on the non-recourse world, because of the way these lenders want these things, you're looking at probably about a minimum $500,000 in equity to make this uh, make sense. Now, if you have properties that don't have that, there, you can probably go to a bank lender and, and get something similar to go free up some equity. And they're going to be recourse, but kind of does the same thing, can cross collateralize your, your properties. And then prepayment penalties. Oh, these are fun. Why do you think they have prepayment penalties on these things? They want to make money. They want to make money. Why, how do they make money? Interest. Interest. So they have pro forma on their investment. Um, PPM to these hedge fund investors, they're going to get X amount of interest for X amount of years when they go buy these securitized loans. And if one of them falls out or a deal falls out, that kind of wrecks their entire package. So they want you to basically compensate them for pulling those things out. So another thing to say there is if you have a bunch of these things and you're going to go cross collateralize them into one you know, one loan, you want to make sure that you have the ones you're going to keep inside that loan and the ones you're thinking about selling outside of it because you don't want to be able to break these things up and have prepayment penalties. It is a giant headache. So that's another word, word of caution there. Uh, cash out, 70, 75%. Um, I've seen 80% in some instances. We do have a, uh, a gentleman in Texas we got 80% on, which is quite aggressive. Uh, debt serving coverage ratio is one to five. We've seen 1.2. You get a bit higher. The, the larger these things are, you know, the lower the debt serving requirements are on, the, on them. Um, they do 30 year fixed and any variation there of an arm that you want to. And then rates vary like, you know, like interest rates, but they're very competitive. You know, you're not talking eights, you're talking mid sixes. You know, if you're, if you're a good qualified uh, borrower. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. They're very, very simple. It's a very low doc loan um, versus the other, you know, uh, lending out there as far as like, hey, here's everything in my, you know, on me, and my kid, and my dog, and I've got to write a letter of explanation on why I bought this, you know, soda at 7-Eleven last year. They don't really care. All they care about is the property and make sure cash flows. That's it. They're going to require some tax returns just to make sure there's no other uh, liens that can jump ahead of them. But as long as the property's appraised and your rent roll's good, it's done. You know, they can fund these things in, you know, 30 to 45 days, sometimes faster. Um, sometimes in the appraisals, we got some winners out there that, that I know about that will do um, desktop appraisals, drive-bys, don't need full appraisals. It's pretty cool. So just an alternative way you guys think about as far as how to access funds, because the number one thing we're seeing right now is there are deals out there. You have to go buy an investment property to go make money. If you don't, if your liquidity is tied up someplace, you can't access it, that's a problem. You want to be able to access it quickly to be able to jump on these deals, and here's just one alternative way to do it. And that's all I've got. Um, this is obviously recorded um, live, but if you guys don't want to hear all the fluff on myself, then just do my, uh, download my ebook, especially guys on, online, the uh, book.billybrown.me. It'll be really easy to get. But this is the point where you guys ask me a lot of questions, and we throw the uh, the boo box away. I want to leave plenty of time for that because there's uh, you know there's a lot of people in the room, obviously online. Oh, here's two caveats on the questions. One, do not ask me to do math live, especially this early. I can't do it. And the second thing is, if you got a deal like a question specific to your situation, let's keep that to side. We'll, we'll talk about that later and, and set up an appointment. But if it could help everyone out, just go ahead and and, and, and pipe in. Uh, so you had mentioned the line of credit. Mm -hmm. What's what exactly is the how do how do you even go to yeah. uh, and look at the line of credit? So if you have cash either sitting in the bank yeah. or equity that you could do the refinancing yeah. for, how does that even start? 
Yeah, there are lenders that are that are specialized in the alternative world, and there's also there's bank lenders that do as well. They're just going to take the liquidity you have, as long as you can prove it. It's like, hey, it's sitting in a checking account here. Then they go, okay, well, we'll fund up to 80% of any acquisition. Here's how much we'll go lend you. So easy math is you got $200,000 sitting there, they'll give you a million dollar line of credit. And now it's property specific. It's not going to be like a blank check like you could at a, at a bank. But they'll go close these things in, in, in five to ten days. Now, a, a lender, a local lender, might just give you a, like, hey, here's your line of credit. Don't talk to us. But these guys, as they are um, uh, not recourse, they got to be a little more hands-on when it comes to funding the deals. They'll go do a, dry, or do a desktop appraisal and then fund it. But they'll put as many properties as you want to on that, on that line of credit. So it just really just boils down to liquidity, and those can happen you know, we've seen those things improved in a couple of weeks. Really easy to do. If you've got experience and you got liquidity, it's easy to do. Got it. Thank you. Yep. You talked about this this process right mm -hmm. here. I'm assuming this is paying off my the mortgage that I have now yep. and just rolling into a new uh, yep. first, right? Yep. Okay. And then what other kind of things um, can you do? So, like, what uh, are some other options for financing that you guys do that in the alternative world? Yeah. Um, we specialize at, at ACS basically three things. Um, SBA is, is one of them, which is probably not pertinent to, the, to, to this, uh, this world. I'm not good at SBA. I can, yeah, I'm not good at SBA, but we have uh, some in our office that are really good at SBA. We are uh, very good at bridge lending, and that includes uh, ground-up construction as, as well. Um, the bridge lending rush should be get about to, hopefully, uh, next probably 60 days, become a Bidco, which is a fully regulated bank lender to be do bridge lending on the commercial world. And then anything, you know, CRE-backed. So where we specialize in is the creativity of not just like, hey, we've got a loan product. It's a, oh, here's a strategy on how to go do this. Um, prime example, um, I wish they were here, um, but I didn't see them. But um, you know, through this group, we actually uh, helped out a, an investor that was trying to buy a vacant self-storage out in Memphis area. And no lender wants to lend on a vacant business. Shocking. It's just sitting there. It's a brand, it's a basically a nice self-storage facility, but there's no income coming from it. They're like, no. So his other choice was to go do, you know, go do all cash. And he was having trouble raising cash because it's Memphis. It's like, what do you do? So we all do a uh, range for bridge lending. Um, he was able to acquire it for way less than what the tax appraised value was. Give him a working capital. He used the money he raised uh, from his investors to go improve it. And then simultaneously, we were underwriting it through an SBA loan. And 90 days later, he's able to not only cash out the loan, cash out his investors, but he got another $100,000 on top of that. Now, it would have been like three months had the title company not screwed up, but... It's a whole other project, but that's some things that we can kind of do there. It's not just like, here is a loan product we will go do for you. It's what is the end goal? What is your, how do we maximize your ROI for yourself and your investors? And then how do we put this into, into place? And that's what we, we love doing as far as the, the sequencing there. Yeah. So so what I'm hearing is yeah. if, if we've got something that's, that's kind of more creative mm -hmm. and we're not exactly sure, mm -hmm. um, we, we have some ideas of how to structure that possibly. Yeah. We come to you and say, hey, I got this idea. Leverage what you guys know and some of the relationships that you have mm -hmm. to poss probably make the deal better than we could do on our own. Exactly. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And we're, we're good. I mean, the, the flipping world stuff, there's, you know, a million different flippers out there. That's not our specialty. But if you're, gonna, if you're going to acquire it, make it pretty, and then do a cash out refinance and, and do a, basically it's a burst strategy on a commercial unit or apartment complex, we're very, very good at that. We're very good at that. So, all right. No one's ever asked, about, asked the one question out there, which is like the, the bad side about non-recourse. I'll ask that in a second. Yeah, ask that a question, okay. Well, that's not my question, so you can answer that later. <laughs> but, uh, no, I was gonna say, can you talk about the uh, qualifications a little bit, how you're looking at the deal? Are you looking at someone's personal income? Are you looking at the property? No. Can you just talk about how you qualify somebody a little bit? No. Don't care. Don't care about personal income. Experience does matter. They want to make sure that the, the person that is, is, you know, they're still guaranteeing it, you know, because there's a bad boy carve outs and all these non-recourse loans, but they want to make sure that the person that is doing it is not a rookie because when bad things happen, do you know what to do to, to right the ship? 
because they don't want to take these properties. That's not their, what they're in, in this thing for. They want to be able to service them and make their money off, off the interest. But in, in essence, it's all about the property and the cash flow of the property. So if it is a, your, you know, your pool, let's just say you've got a million dollar you know, loan across you know, four or five properties, and it's 75% of the appraised value, that's fantastic what they want. And as long as it cash flows, they're good. You know, as long as you meet the, the, the credit score requirements and you know what you're doing and have a team, that's really it. I mean, it's, I mean very low doc. They don't care about, they don't ask for pay stubs at all. So, yeah. Now you can answer your yeah. non recourse question. Yeah. Unless that's sad, that's that. So, yeah. So, you, you talked about the positives of non recourse. Yeah. What are the negatives? So here's some of the negatives, um, and this actually goes into if you go do apartment lending, the Fannie Freddie HUD stuff. Obviously, these guys are not making you personally guarantee anything. Do you think they're going, you're going to get your money first? No, you're not. Your money is actually transferred into a joint account, basically with the the lender, and they're actually going to hold back some repairs based on what they think they're gonna do. Now, they're going to escrow for those, you actually tap them if you, if you need repairs, but they're gonna escrow for those. And then once the money is paid the loan, they've met the escrow account, they release your funds, you know, three to five days later. So it's not like you go, hey, I've got this loan you normally do, and then you go pay out your, your, your um, so the income comes in, and then you get the loan, they're just gonna pay out to whatever lenders it is. It's everything is housed over there, they do it all, and then sends you the, the, the profit minus any kind of escrow repair. So for your cash flow, if you're living off these things, and you go, ooh, yeah, I got some timing issues there, you wanna make sure you have some liquidity and some, um, some reserves to be able to meet these things. But other than that, if you look at the positive side of that is like, wait a minute, they're gonna, they're gonna escrow for me all these repairs? All you do is ask them for it? That's easy. And they just send me the profit, it's almost like accounting. They do all the accounting for you. That's, that's the easy part. So, again, if you guys are like living off this thing and you're used to those checks coming in the first or fifth or whatever and you're used to that kind of cash flow, it's going to be a little bit of adjustment there. So we want to make sure we cover that on the front end when we, um, when we set this up for you. Yeah. So. I've, got a, I've got a couple of questions for you with yeah. my endless curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll make yeah. sure that we get with time to answer everybody else's. Um, really quick, just no listener left behind. Yeah. Can you define the debt service yeah. Coverage ratio. Yes, absolutely. For, for anybody who may be yeah. confused on what that is. So the simple answer is after your income's coming in, I should have put that, no, I'll, I'll hopefully include a slide here. If you guys want something like that, I got some, some slides to go to, but just go look at debt servicing on, on the Googles. So you got income coming in, you subtract out expenses, and that's called your net operating income. And then that covers the debt. That NOI has to be 25% more than the debt payment. Real simple. So you're always, after it all funnels out, you're going to have 25% profit after all your bills are paid, including the, the debt. That's a real simple way of explaining it. If you guys want more in depth, then yeah, go Google it and we can have a conversation later. Cool. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask, and just because we, we haven't really had this discussion here as a group, and I'm not trying to open up a whole can of worms, but oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm doing it for, for, for you. Um, but, but this is more of a discussion maybe yeah, than a, yeah. here's a hard and fast answer. Um, we're, we're all in kind of Dave Ramsey country. Oh, yeah. Where it's anti-debt, yeah. pay cash for everything. Mm -hmm. um, what, I, I, number one, I'd love your take on that. Obviously, yeah. you, you being a lender, yeah. I kind of know what the answer is going to be. Yeah. Um, but I'm asking this as a piggyback off of one of our online questions yeah. of how do I skip the bank altogether? Are there other options, mm. things like what, what Tom Lonnie is doing yeah. with being your own bank yeah. versus just paying cash for, for properties and not having the oh, yeah. uh, be, being obligated to... Uh, serve the lender, yeah. so to speak. So I'd love your answer on it. And to be honest, I would I would love some yeah. some group feedback and discussion. I'd love to hear kind of where where everybody's at on that. So hope that's an appropriate question. Yeah, it is. Um, so it is. Here's the great answer to that. No matter what your your boat is, you're right. I mean, you're really you're really right because it's it's where you are in your life cycle as far as how much debt you're going to take on versus how much not. Now, 
caveats to the Dave Ramsey world here. I know Dave. Dave's best friend is a mentor of mine. I'm never going to talk bad about Dave. Dave has a very small group of people that he targets, about the bottom one third of, of the United States, that really need financial education. But it spills over in the other world as well, just as he's that much of a powerful voice. Bot bottom one third in terms of just income. Yeah, just like, hey, live within your means. Live within your means. And that's, we should all do that. I mean, I'm absolutely, you know, we're paying off debt as well. You know, we're not trying to be stupid. It's like, we all live within our means. But you can't get rich saving. You can't. Why is that? Well, they print too much money. The value of our dollar is going down, so you have to go invest to go keep up with inflation and everything else that's going on in the world. And you have to go create passive income. You can't go pa create passive income saving. You have to go invest. Unless you're one of those weird people, uh, you know, you wrote number one song every year after year, if you have that much money coming in, you can't go pay cash for these deals. So you have to leverage, you have to partner with banks. Now people get the, the, the wrong impression of uh, banks and lenders as they're the bad guys. No, they're actually the good guys. They actually help you and partner with you on these deals because you can hide behind us and them going, hey, my lender's asking for this. My lenders ask for this, and the reason is they want to make sure the value is there and the cash flow is there. And you're using their resources for free, you know, until they close, to be able to vet that deal to make sure it's going to meet their criteria as well as yours. So you're always in a safe bet there. And then you go back to debt servicing requirements of, oh, you don't want to get in debt because you might, you know, foreclose or something like that. The banks will not let you do that nowadays. They're so much more conservative as they should be when it comes to lending. So circling back there as far as like, hey, what do you do? Like, well, if you're in a point in that life where you don't want to mess with the banks, you just want to go buy a house a year and pay cash for it, God love you. I, I, I'm really jealous that you can go do that and, and live off that income. For us, we have a longer point to where we're going to retire, probably another 20, 25 years. So we have the ability to go leverage to a point, but at a certain point, you know, when we're 60s, we're going, hey, we're going to shut this thing down and start not borrowing as much. And then you go into the hyper into that one and you go, well, hey, you know what? We're not going to be personally guaranteeing these things. We're going to go syndicate a deal. And that's a whole other uh, subject there because then you're not borrowing your own money. You're using other people's money to go create, you know, create businesses through real estate. Does that kind of answer the question? Or? Yeah, and I, I'd love, if anybody else has any feedback, maybe, maybe yeah, from Bill's, Bill. Yeah. I'd love to hear yeah. from Tom on this too yeah. just because I know you have a whole, whole other take on this as well too. So for me, and I'm hearing a lot from you, you Billy, is there's good debt and bad debt. Yeah. So we're talking about assets here. Yeah. Like you, you're standing up on stage talking about assets, not liabilities. Correct. We're yeah. not talking about financing a $250,000 Lamborghini here. No. We're talking about financing things using debt that's making us money. Yeah. So when I realized leverage and was able to really utilize and harness leverage of other people's money, banks' money, things like that, the, the net worth sheet that I look at every month, every quarter, mm. just starts going, going up. Mm. So it, when I was able to do a lot of that and really realize that it's good debt, and then what it did allow me to do was pay off a lot of my bad debt, whether yeah. it was you know the home that I live in, that mortgage payment, or pay off all the cars, or whatever we're doing now, we can decide whether we want to take debt or not, and then what's it going to do to leverage with my business or any of the houses we're doing or things like that. But the other thing that it does is it gives you that speed, like you're talking about. So when you're young, you might want to be more aggressive like Billy's talking about, where you want to build that wealth when you're young, and then you can pay off all that debt when you're a little bit older and your runway gets a little shorter and you don't want to be as aggressive. It's the same in the stock market. You know, you, um, you want to be aggressive and then uh, start tapering it off as you, get, as you get older towards retirement age. So uh, for me, I, I use Tom's strategy too to become my own bank and, and all of this stuff that you're talking about, I think the power of banks and other people's money is really powerful when you're do, using for good debt, not when you're using it for everything else that's not making you money. But one of the things we also, we, we know as investors, we don't pay retail. You know, we're, we're buying something that has built-in equity in it, so it's already worth more when you go buy it because of how we improve the cash flows, how we improve the, 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 the property itself, like, like Bill does. So, yeah, I mean, it's one way to do it. All right, Tom. Yeah. Blows away. So I totally agree with everything Bill just said. One of the most powerful slides that I felt like you had was the 
bank paying you $750 for the use of $100,000. Fantastic deal. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> so the, the thing that I'm seeing is, is that even when you're creating your own bank, like I help people do by doing the overfunding of life insurance to be able to act like a banker and earn like a banker, you are wanting to put yourself in the position of being able to loan out, you know, money from your own bank at yeah. a slow interest rate and then actually turn it out, turn it around and use somebody who needs money at a higher interest rate. So and if you can put yourself in that position, yeah. that's the most powerful thing. And, and that's, that's another little segue there as you talk about investors and a whole other like, hey, don't get in the room. But you go use that money, go over funding your life insurance policy with, with, with Tom. You go, well, now what do I do? I'm so busy with life. How do I go make money off that? Well, I'll borrow that money. You know, we have from 8 to 12% to go put in deals. And what's that do for you? Like, you've got another income stream there off arbitrage. And you still have a life insurance policy that's, you know, growing and growing and growing, you know, tax-free. So there's, there's lots of ways to go do it and, and partner with people. It's not like that's bad, like where you're borrowing for folks. You just got to make sure what you're borrowing on is, is a good deal and that the fundamentals are there. And also the people that are doing it know what they're doing. Uh, and again, going back to lenders, that's what we do. We go verify all that. Okay. Thank you, Billy, for all yeah. of this. Yeah, absolutely. This is Leslie. I don't know. Hi, you. Leslie. Um, <laughs> so an A and B part question. Okay. So A deals with um, seasoning and the length of how long you've owned the, the asset. Yep. And then B, regardless of the answer to A, if I come to you with my rental property and say I've owned it less than a year, but my current DCSR is, I don't know, 1.4 plus. Yeah, way up there, yeah. Does that work? Uh, seasoning, so there's probably, I don't know, um, six or seven lenders we work with that do the strategy as far as non-recourse. Each one of them has a little bit different flavor on seasoning. Seasoning means just that how long you've owned the property to be able to use the appraised value. Otherwise, they got to use the... The, uh, the contract price uh, that falls under the HVCRE rules. If you guys want to go look up some fun laws, go look up HVCRE, high velocity commercial real estate. Um, so, so you got that. And then was that a question, Leslie? I'm sorry. No. Regardless of how long yeah. I have owned it, yeah. if my DSCR is 1.4 plus on, there, that, on that rental. There's probably some lenders I want to work with you. It's just a matter of is it going to be recourse or non-recourse. Okay. And how are you going to, you know, is you going to portfolio them or are you going to do them as a, you know, as a one-off to be able to tap those? And then how, how bankable are you? You know, you go back to like, can you, you know, can you go through a Fannie Freddie, which is a six month seasoning and you want to go through that brain trauma, then yeah. I mean, if it's easy, your W2 employee and your, your everything's clean, it's easy to go do. But if not, then you have alternatives in the, in the other spaces, either the bank lenders, which can be usually a 20-year amortization, or the other non-bank stuff that we have, which gets a little bit more creative and, you know, slightly higher rates, but, you know, less, again, less brain trauma. So lots of options. You know, you don't, you know, the bottom line here is you don't have to just go to your Fannie and Freddie mortgage lender to go, hey, I want to buy a rental property. There's, there's lots of ways to go do it, or refinance my rental property. There's lots more ways to go do it. So, does that answer your question, Leslie? Thank you. Yeah. Are we ready for B? Uh, oh, I forgot that one. I forgot that one. Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> That's the questions. Um, all right, so you guys ready for the, uh, the accountabilities? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, accountability buddies, come up here. Seth and, and uh, where's Jeremy? Who is that, me and you? Oh, uh, yeah. Jeremy? Yep. Okay. Where are your, where are your accountabilities? <sighs> Maybe we, maybe we explain. Yeah, recap, yeah, re recap, yeah, recap what, recap. recap what I stepped into job, in February. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's give it up for Billy, by the way. Yeah, great, great job. It's awesome. So in January, I believe it was, we, we talked it's about it's, it's, the yeah. four disciplines of execution yeah. as a business cadence. It's a great book by Franklin Covey, if you guys have not read it, go get it. It is literally one of the best business books I've ever read. And um, kind of just taught some ways that you can use it as investors. And Billy, bless his heart, was our <laughs> guinea pig <laughs> who volunteered and yeah. put it out there. But it basically centers around coming up with 
what is called a WIG, W-I-G, a wildly important goal. To define that, if every other area of my business remained at a standstill, what one thing would make the biggest impact on the whole? So that's, that's the concept of a WIG. So number one, it's about having clarity and, and, and having really no more than one to two WIGs at a time. Because if you have any more than that, chances are none of them are going to be accomplished. So it's kind of hard to come up with, but um, Billy was able I'm to clarify here, yeah. that very, very quickly. I was actually amazed at how, how fast you came up with yours. I, well, I've been dwelling on it for a while. Just, and I had other areas of my life, though, so even the workout stuff is, is really easy. The business stuff, I mean, you should see the business stuff I came up with. Um, that we got down, thanks to you know Brandon Turner and, and all that. But I could not get, I could not get past on the, the real estate investing because I know as a lender... And I've done some small stuff going, I've got access to all this information, all, all the knowledge and all the money really you want to. Why am I not? Why are we not actually going out there and doing bigger things? And so, like, how do we go do that? I was really in a, in a rut, and it worked out perfectly going, I'll be your huckleberry. Yeah. Like, help me out here. I mean, seriously, <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know. And, you know, one, to put me out there for accountability, but two, also really help me out as far as tangible goals for that specific goal. Yeah. So. So maybe recap, um, as me and Jeremy were your uh, accountability partners for our first WIG meeting, what, Live. what was the WIG? Maybe just to recap for people who were either here and forgot about it or don't yeah. know what it was in the first place. Well, hopefully, I mean, probably everyone remembers it because uh, it was really out there. I was going to syndicate a 100-unit apartment complex by June 30th, 2019. Okay, so very specific. Very Remember, specific. the WIGs have to be a, a, a time-locked thing. It can't just be... Focus on syndication. That's not a good wig. His very specific syndicate a 100 unit, again, very specific there, apartment complex by June 30th, 2019. Um, so here we are today. Do you have an update for us? Well, I, I apologize because, I, again, I, was, I really wanted to come last one, but I was just at the uh, CCIM meeting to be able to, I know you wanted me to like, give an update of what we're doing. So what did we come up with as far as my, what was I supposed to be doing? Yeah, so lead measures maybe? Yeah, you, lead you, measures. You're going to come yeah. on this side. There yeah. you go. Um, so we, this is actually February 6th. I looked it up. It was, so between uh, February 6th and today, there's 45 working days. There's my, my tracking. You guys want to see that? Step out of the way here. So, yeah, it's important having a yeah. scorecard. Yeah, scorecard. So we came up with my goal to be able to talk to two commercial real estate brokers a day. Yeah. I panicked after that. <laughs> <laughs> Because it was a high goal, or, or because, because I didn't. It's like I know I could go look through all these the CCIM folks that do commercial um, or multifamily, and try to find them. So I called Jody Butcher. There you go. Jody, or she's not here today, but the um, she's a fantastic ten thirty one intermediary, very very smart. Yeah. As a Jody, I stepped in it. Um, you heard my goal there. She's sitting right next to me. Who are there a couple like commercial real estate investors or um, excuse me, commercial multifamily realtors that I should talk to? She goes, Oh, let me do this. Let me send you my spreadsheet. <laughs> Y'all, she sent me a spreadsheet of, I don't know, probably 200. Wow. Wow. There you go. Talk about paving in the way. Like, That's oh amazing. my gosh. There yeah. You go. All their contact information, who they work with. So I just picked two a day and, and, and wrote, uh, wrote through them, plus all my contacts for you guys, you, you know. Yeah. All right. And I was trying to get one uh, uh, offering memorandum a, a week. Yeah, and those are what we would call our lead measures. So lead that's measures, yeah. what behavior would yeah. greatly influence, the, would have the greatest influence on the wig. So those and, and are that, his lead measures. And we're doing all this to not to say, hey, how great I am as a, you know, whatever. It's like, I'm, y'all, I'm scared to death. I put myself out there and, you know, you can do it too if this is what you want to do. And it really, yeah. really, really helped out. So um, here's my scorecard. I talked to 19 realtors and wholesalers and I had three OMs. Yeah. it's awesome. Did I, did I meet my goal? Uh, not per week, right? Not even close. So what happened? I, fa I mean, by judging this, I failed. Okay. We're under contract. Ah, nice. all right. Now we're under contract on 82 unit up in Lexington, Kentucky. That is right now an eight cap, which is amazing. And we're thinking it's going to be able to perform to a probably nine, nine and a half cap in the next 24 months. All right, that's awesome. Let's give it up for Billy. That's that's amazing. So. 
so three, that, like t- less than, what was that two months? Less than two months. Yeah. I it, went from, oh my gosh, do that now. The next step was like, oh my gosh, what do you do next? That's a whole other topic there, um, maybe for the podcast. But again, okay, so I failed. It's only 82 units. Is that a failure, guys? <laughs> Bill well, says go get another that, one. Yeah, that and it's not closed yet. So, it's the, But things are looking really, really good. Yeah, knock on wood, hopefully. But guess what? This guy has two other properties behind it yeah. that he wants to sell. Plus, the realtor brought to me has several other uh, pocket listings. There you go. So it's not that like, hey, I'm going to fill this thing. It's the setting up the train of others, and I've got help now to be able to go do this. So if you guys are out there scared to death as far as like, hey, what should I do? I want to go do this. It doesn't matter if you can do multifamily investing or whatever. I mean, follow this, you know, go back and watch that on February 6th and just go through it and have some accountability. And these guys actually, I mean, they're fantastic. I mean, I, I was talking to Jeremy quite a bit. I mean, and, and a few others going, what the heck do I do? And they're really good at, at, uh, at holding me, my feet to the fire. Yeah. So, well, as your accountability yeah, partners, we'll give you we'll give you a pat on the back. Let's give it up for Billy again. That was awesome, man. You, you got anything else you want to you want to add, for people to uh, to take away from today? Uh, think creatively. Here, push. Yeah, just push it once. There you go. Think creatively. Um, lenders are your friend. Um, if you have a good lender, stick with them. If you guys need additional lending resources, reach out to us. Um, Always educate yourself on, on lending and deals and how to think outside the box, and you'll succeed. And then, obviously, just take a step. That's all you need to do. It's awesome. We'll give it up for Billy Brown. It's amazing. It's so good. Hey, thanks for learning with us today on the show. We would love to meet you at one of our free monthly meetups in Middle Tennessee. Hit the thumbs up button if you like the content. Make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss a thing on this channel. Check out another awesome investing video here.